The following interview was conducted with uh, Judy Roberts, Management Information Specialist, Purdue Libraries for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, September 19, 2008, in Stewart Center's television studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome, Judy. Good afternoon, and tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Okay. I was born in Shelbyville, Indiana, and the bulk of my early years were actually spent in Lafayette from age four, which would have been 1955, okay. and I haven't moved away yet, but I'm about to. Uh, my parents are both Indiana natives, and we moved here in about 1954, and my father was an employee of the university, where he was head, became eventually head of Central Duplicating, which is now Printing Services. And my mother worked for a number of years for the graduate school as a secretary and then for the School of Industrial Engineering as a secretary there, too, for the uh, dean of industrial engineering. Okay. Where did you go to tell about grade school and high school? Where did you go? I went through the Lafayette School Corporation, graduating from Lafayette Jefferson High School, and then enrolled at Purdue University, where I have a BA. Okay, what was high school like? Any activities or athletics or clubs? Uh, no, not really at uh, that time. I spent a lot of my time um, working when I wasn't in school. Okay. And I did the usual um, jobs that most high school students get, uh, babies, everything from babysitting to sure. making pizzas, working in restaurants. Yeah. Did you think of going, had you applied to any other places or did you want to come to Purdue? No, I came to Purdue on uh, initially on the employee discount, but at that time that was not significant enough. I came in on my father's uh, dependent's disability from World War II and went through school on that, which was much cheaper, and I won't tell anybody what that that price was right now compared to what the unfortunate souls are having to pay for right. education now. Right. Did you live on campus? No. Okay, so you commuted. Well, tell us a little uh -huh. about uh, uh, what, any of your classes and professors and what was your major? My major was uh, secondary education social studies, and the classes were slightly smaller than now, given at that time, and this was in the 60s, so some of the campus unrest that went through in the 60s was happening here, so people find that difficult to believe since Purdue is such a tranquil environment, but it actually was happening here. And I was fortunate enough to see the rise of what would become the black, today's Black Cultural Center take effect during the years when I was an undergraduate here, mm -hmm. which was a very interesting education, interesting time, and especially set the groundwork for the university's push that you're still unfortunately hearing about today, which is diversity. Sure. One would have hoped after 30-some years that diversity wouldn't be the issue, but it still is. Right. That was the original one, the one that was there on university, the house yes, that was there? Yes, yes, and actually even before it came about, the students actually banding together to talk with the uh, president at that time and get some action yeah. done so that they could have a black culture center. I have center. a facility, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well then, when you finished college, what was next? Did you have a clear path before you came uh, to no, Purdue? Well, no. I uh, knew that I wanted to look around a little and I was hired at the uh, university. Uh, the person in personnel at that time was one Catherine Marquis when I was hired. and. Um, came in thinking that I would spend just a few years here working in the libraries until I saw a more clear career path. And um, either I found the career path in the libraries or I've never found a clear <laughs> career path, but I was still here after 35 years. Oh, very good. Did you, uh, were you certified for teaching when you finished then, so you could have gone into teaching? Or yes, I could have gotten the certification, yeah. Okay. Applied and gotten the certification, yes. Right, okay. Yeah. Well, let's tell us, talk a little bit about that the various positions and things you had in the library certainly primarily was what was known as tech service, technical services. Yes, I started off as a clerk uh, doing approval plans and processing those. And at that time in technical services, there were, well, in the acquisitions department, because technical services wasn't consolidated, it was actually two different departments, acquisitions and cataloging. Um, the acquisitions department did all the pre-order searching, uh, processed the receipts, place the orders, and also at that time the payments were made within that area. And there were uh, three professional librarians. Uh, the head of the department was Don Ferris, uh, Kathleen McCullough, 
was my immediate supervisor, and she was the main bibliographer at that time. And um, Harry Kuntz was the professional who was over the serials acquisitions side of the uh, acquisitions area. And uh, there were three or four people who did pre-order searching, and probably the entire processing staff at that time uh, was probably 15 people. Okay. No I computers? Guess. No, no. No computers at that time. Okay. Tell, for researchers, tell them what approval plan, what that had, what that referred An to. An approval plan refers to creating a profile of what you want ordered that will meet the subject needs at the university with in the boundaries of a number of publishers. And it's almost a blanket order where you say we will take pretty much everything that fits this profile, um, but you do have approval uh, options so that if something comes in that is marginal to what you would want to add to the collection, you can return it. Okay. What was your initial thing? Did you work with the approval plan primarily? I worked then? Yeah. Uh, primarily with the approval plan initially, and then two or three years later, I got into working with um, the acquisitions of the serial material, which is journals, newspaper, okay. uh, that type of material. Tell us a little bit about that, how that was different from the monographs and the books. Uh, the difference with the serials is that the initial use of computers uh, came about with them in order to try to track what you had on a recurring order basis, which is what you generally do with serials, and to track the payments and to track what kind of price increases were occurring uh, in order to manage the budget. Those issues still are with us today, with serials being one of the fastest inflating and highest inflating areas of library materials. Um, at that time, I'm not even sure how many serial subscriptions we had, uh, and the advent of the computer world was that we started off um, coding data on 80 column sheets, which would then be sent to Freehaver, where they would be key punched into cards and then fed into a computer, at which time overnight they would turn around and send us back sheets that told us what had been updated and what were errors that were made there. And then once a month, you got a full run of a serials list that sh showed all the updates. Mm -hmm. And you also handled at that time any kind of problems with the ordering end of it, not so much receiving, though that could, could carry into it. Isn't that about the same time when they had the serials print out listing in the libraries? Yes. Yes. Well, that was yes. Uh, yes. an offshoot. Uh, was that done off-site or? Uh, that Bill was Curry done. Was involved yeah, in that it. was done off-site also, and it um, was unique at that time. There wasn't anything similar, was there? N not that I know of. Okay. Um, it was a long process to do, though, because it listed each title and the call number, and it too had to be coded in cataloging um, using again 80 column sheets decode it and then sent off to be um, updated. And it was only updated about once every six months, the full run on that. So you had a lot of handwritten notes and a lot of very large 80-column uh, computer printouts right. running an A to Z listing of what you had. And they were scattered you know, in, in, among the li in the libraries right, around right. there. Each floor of the libraries had a listing of those. And then eventually they moved to using a company named um, Autographics to actually produce the same list on Microfish and thought that was a pretty big technological step forward at that time. Um, and <laughs> then you had to have the piece of changes. equipment in order to use it, right? Yes, yes, you had to have a Microfish reader in order to use it, yes, yes. <laughs> Oh, what about the binding? Were you ever involved in any of that, and how did that change? When I got involved with the binding, it was actually later in about the 80s or 90s when I got involved in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the binding has changed over the years in that there is a computer program now, as opposed to everything had to be done on cards and sent with the pieces to the bindery, which was off campus. Um, now, the pieces still get off campus, but there is a program that can be used to update and send all the information that needs to go to have a volume bound to um, 
the company that does the binding. Mm -hmm. Though companies now that are doing binding have consolidated and are becoming fewer because there is less print material being purchased. So their volume of business has gone down as we've moved forward into the electronic era and the advent of the web. Right, okay. Um, the, what was the next step on the serials? After that serials print on, what did the, and the microfiche? After and then, the microfiche, yeah. then you moved into a local homegrown system uh, that was Lookup, I believe was the right. name of it, right. which was a computer program where, again, we had to um, code sheets of paper, again, with what we wanted with changes in order to update it. Those were then keyed in here onto a magnetic disk, which was then sent to Freehafer for processing, and then the information would come back. And then after that, after Lookup, we got into Notice, which was the first LMS. Uh, commercial company produced, which then allowed us to start doing updates online via computer systems and computer terminals. And then the big step was the first advent of the Voyager system at the same time that Microsoft Windows and Microsoft had become the big company. And that now has progressed to where we do immediate updates and it's immediately seen by our users and internationally. Right, and that's made a big impact on the whole process. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yes, no yes, more. We, the check-in, the check-ins have changed for the serials, for the researchers, so because they think, oh, mm -hmm. people used to check things in by hand. They don't have to do that anymore. Um, no, but it's it's still not quite as automated as you would like. Some places, but not many that I know of, mm -hmm. use a barcode one, and we'll try to read the UPC or the the universal product code or the uh, barcode on the piece as it comes in, but there is still not sophisticated enough equipment to actually do what Purdue needs done to get it to its, its site. So there's still individuals who record volume issue year when we receive the material market, and then it goes directly into uh, distribution. Right. Isn't another change we now have our own computer? We yes, didn't, uh, so we didn't have to rely on something else on campus. Right, right. The libraries now has their own servers to which uh, the information is recorded on, and each employee pretty much has their own um, personal computer that they're using, as well as those individuals who are now using notebooks and Blackberries and <laughs> their telephones and everything else, <laughs> as well as our users use the same right. things to access right. the information. Oh dear. Let's talk a little bit about then the uh, management information specialist. What mm -hmm. some changes that you how that came about and what that the, entailed. That came about basically a need for the libraries to be able to answer more quickly the effects of its collection purchases on its budget and to attempt to start making some projections as to what our costs would be in the eras when we were seeing double digit inflation. On there. And it came about first with using, um, I can't even remember the program now, um, a program that the libraries purchased and housed locally. And to that, we would download from our library system information about journals, initially journals and journals only in there. And then we could analyze the information and produce lists of titles and and cost estimates and et cetera out of that. Uh, the next iteration of that then was with, again, the Microsoft products. It became possible to start using Microsoft Access. And we could download into that on a database and start doing queries, again, downloaded locally to the PC, whereas now what we do is connect via the uh, server. And we do things real time, just not bringing, doing a server PC um, interface where we're not actually loading all data onto one local PC and it's accessible to anybody in the library system who connects using access to the system. Okay. What sort of specialized training is that? Was there some training that you needed? To uh, a lot of it initially. I was trained by some people out of our IT departments and then did a lot of learning on my own of how to at least do drop and drag queries and use some of the parameters to write some fairly basic queries and obtain the information from there. Mm -hmm. um, and then like everyone else, but not like 
the people who have grown up now with the computers. I've learned to use Excel and Word and some of the other right. products to make better yeah. reports. And right. You helped uh, with uh, statistics as well, the uh, libraries that they have to report I work, to ARO. Yes, I do a lot with the ARL statistics, right. compiling Which are always those. always a challenge. Yes, and I uh, do that once a year. And that's enough about the ARL statistics right. along there. Um, and then the other thing that I've moved into and where management information is now be becoming more of electronic resource management is I've moved into managing our actual electronic resources, which entails making sure that we activate the resource once we've purchased it and make it accessible to our users uh, using some Ex Libris products, which are SFX, and also for the journals and using uh, Metalib, which is a database federated search engine, and getting the information into that, as well as still producing reports to the library's administration as we're evaluating our licenses for electronic access with various publishers. Mm -hmm. And the licensing of the electronic access is probably the most revolutionary step in the libraries for journals because now instead of necessarily just buying the journal outright as one would do with a printed copy and shelving it, one is purchasing access and having to get into the legal side of licensing access to that material. That's a challenge. That is a big challenge. Right. Yeah. And there's yeah. and more journals are becoming more electronic all the time. Yes, and more right. of them are moving to electronic only, as well as um, whatever <laughs> whatever the next iteration will be will be interesting to see there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you served under uh, several heads. Mr. Dagnesi was the head when you came. Yes. Yeah. yeah and, he then, uh, and then. And then. Emily. Emily came. Emily. Emily and Mobley. And now we have uh, and, um, James Mullins. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you ser talk mm -hmm. about some committees that you've served on the library and, and um, university committees as well. Mm -hmm. On some of those. Yeah, I've served uh, in the libraries. I've served on the um, clerical service advisory committee when I was in the clerical service position, and I've served. Well, every AP member is a member of the uh, libraries administrative professional advisory committee as well as served on implementation committees of uh, various uh, library systems in there. And usually the implementation committees are, are in many ways the most challenging and the most rewarding because you're actually working to implement a product that will make things better for the users as well as the staff in many ways. That's right, so. yes. And at the university level, I've been a member of the university administrative uh, professional Advisory Committee, and that gave a broader insight to what was going on in the university at a university level rather than just what was happening within the libraries at the library level, and also included the regional campuses, which is right. interesting to interact and see how they interact with the sure. main campus here at West Do you Lafayette. have any contact with the regional campus at all in the management, especially? With yes, your, oh. yes. Um, in working with the uh, Ex Libris products, we have a consor consortial agreement, which includes the two regional campuses. So in implementing those in the past year and a half um, for the libraries, I've worked closely with those two campuses and which the individuals. Two, which two? North Central? North and Central Cal Calumet. Okay. Uh, and the individuals there that I've worked with are uh, K.R. Johnson, who is the director at North Central, and uh, Sherry Kristen. I'm trying to remember what Sherry's position is at Calumet. Uh, I think she's the technical mm -hmm. services librarian at, at the Calumet Libraries. Okay. Do the licensing uh, does do you, are you involved with when the it expires and for renewals, or does is that what Bill Correa kind of keeps on tap? Uh, that's almost a yes and no. Oh, okay. When it comes to the practical information of the licensing, making sure that all the titles that we have subscriptions for are within the license, that they get activated, um, that cost information is supplied to the electronic licensing librarian. I do that end of it. Mr. Corrier actually does the review of the licenses for the language and will do a lot of the negotiation for the terms and the use rights. 
All right. Are they increasing the number of suppliers or dealers that they have for the, or as far as the, getting the, the licenses or not, or is it the same? The sources that they're using. Um, depends right. on, how are you defining well, source? Well, they, you've got, uh, say, actually, we're, we're, what, what organizations mm -hmm. are you signing licenses with? Perhaps that's another way. Well, I just mean. about any, any okay. organization, any publisher, okay. um, from which you want some kind of service you're going to license. We license the use of the Ex Libris products, which are for open no, URL. Know. Just make a comment with the Ex Libris so the researchers will understand that. And yeah. The Ex Libris products are SFX and Metalib and the Voyager system. SFX is an open URL link resolver system and supplies an A to Z list for our journals, our electronic journals. Metalib is a federated search engine which deals basically with the databases but allows you to search across multiple databases as well as and then link automatically to the article level and retrieve the article for your research. The Voyager system is our uh, system to, that produces our library's catalog. Uh, we use that as our acquisitions tool and our circulation module, and it is a library's integrated system right. in there. So you license the, your use of those. Other licenses are with publishers, mostly, um, for the use of their materials, and those can be for the books that they publish, those can be for the journals that they publish, um, any other kind of material that they publish, and we generally at this time use the philosophy that we try to create one license with a publisher and try to acquire everything that the libraries has a subscription for with that publisher within that license. Yeah, that's and those licenses cover copyright, they cover, cover interlibrary loan uses, they cover who can actually access the material and how you can access it right. and use it. Right, and mo a lot of them are full text, right, that you're getting now? Uh, yes, right yes, now. we try to get full text exclusively now. Right, and that makes it really nice for the users. Yeah. Um, any, um, <clears throat> some of the uh, campus changes over time, the facilities, you should, can you comments on that? Well, the facilities have improved as far as landscaping goes about 100% with the uh, efforts that I believe started with Dr. Hansen to turn this from a bread, red brick campus into a more green area sure. along in there. Um, a large number, especially in the last few years, of new buildings, which was part of the strategic plan with Dr. Jiske. Uh, the library's facilities themselves, service locations, have been reduced over the last 30 years, but we still have, I think now, 11 service locations um, placed around campus to make it easier for faculty who do need to come into the libraries and students to get to the materials. Right, exactly. And there'll be some new ones down the road, like the archives and special collections. Yes. <laughs> the levy's changed mm -hmm. over time since you've been here, hasn't it? Yes, yes. Sears was here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a, a yeah. Sears there. It's now um, got quite a few more shops as far as consumer shops as well as uh, apartment residences or condos along in there, um, whereas at one time it was a few fast food restaurant areas and one supermarket right. uh, along there, as well as a new bridge spanning the Wabash River between Lafayette and West Lafayette. Yeah. And the county has grown a lot too, hasn't it? Because yes. you've lived here yeah. quite a while, you yeah. were almost raised oh, yeah. here. Yeah, and the uh, county has uh, exploded in population compared to what it was. 30, 40 years ago. That's so. right, exactly. Oh, now you got an award, the uh, Dagnese Award. Can yes. you make a comment on any other, as well, mm -hmm. were there any others that you received over time? Tell us about that one too for the Well, the Dagnese Award was just for my efforts in implementing the uh, notice system, the first true library integrated system that we brought up. Um, it was a peer nominated award, so that makes it very special. Uh, to have gained that, and I'm one of the many people on the wall outside of the dean's area in the administration, and it was quite an honor. And it was, it's been a nice award to see how it has awarded other administrative professional and clerical service employees for their extraordinary efforts 
in moving the Purdue libraries forward in some way or the other. Right. How did you find out about it, was it a, or was it a surprise? Or did you know in advance? Before At that time, they only told you briefly in advance because they wanted you to show up for the ceremony, so if they didn't tell you, <laughs> you might not be here that day. <laughs> so uh, that's how I found out. But some, I think it's changed a little bit now, maybe. It may have. Yeah, I, I understand. I don't know how they do the <laughs> notifications. Uh, now tell us a little about your post-Purdue activities. What's, uh, what's next on the agenda? Next on the agenda is retirement, and I intend to take some time just to uh, kind of look around and enjoy myself, and then I'll move forward from there. Um, I'm going to be leaving Indiana and moving to Florida, and I'm looking forward to just relaxing. And enjoying the weather. Enjoying the weather, yep. Yeah, right. Uh, a couple things. Um, got a favorite Purdue tradition that comes to mind? Or an ad, and or an outstanding event mm -hmm. in your life that you'd like to share? With uh, not really anything there. I have enjoyed over the years watching the Purdue women's basketball team um, really not only come, come about, but also win its national championship. And that was fun going to uh, San Jose to watch them not only play in that final, but also to win. Right. Um, any closing comments that you'd like to share with the researchers as you look back and look ahead? <clears throat> Do you like to say? No, I think uh, I think it should be up to them to discover and compare, yeah. and that's uh, part of the strategic plan. That's discover right. Purdue. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Thanks very much. <clears throat>